Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology, back with the channel. And with this video, I'm going to be kicking off a series of videos looking at how clinical neurophysiology can support uh, patients in the intensive care environment. With this video, I'm going to be talking about how we can help assess causes for impaired levels of consciousness. And this video is primarily intended for intensive care unit staff, or perhaps junior doctors who are just going into this environment to better understand what we can offer, some examples of the conditions that are encountered, understand some of the challenges involved and what might need to be considered when making the referral. Let's start from the most fundamental basics. Um, life requires energy and oxygen is critically important in that energy production. Energy production occurs locally in the tissues and so we need to have systems to get oxygen from the environment down into our tissues. And for that, we have our airway, our breathing and our circulation, which make the ABC of life. Now we need a certain level of consciousness and brainstem function and control, even when we're asleep, to maintain the muscle tone in the airway so they don't get clogged up before the air hits the bronchial tree. We need to be able to sense and clear any secretions or vomit so we keep that bronchial tree clear. We need to be able to drive the diaphragm and the chest wall muscles to contract and cause suction to get that air in. And then we need circulatory flow, which will involve our pump, the heart, the vasculature, which is the piping, fluids and carriage cells within the blood to distribute the oxygen to where it needs to go. If there's imp impairment of our level of consciousness, then there can be a failure in the tone of our soft palate, which can then collapse backwards, our epiglottis, the tongue, and they can block up the airway. There may be a failure of gag reflexes, which will allow um, things down into the bronchial tree which shouldn't be there. And there may be a reduction in our ventilatory drive. And so our diaphragm, our chest wall muscles won't contract and suck the air in. And as that energy production fails, tissues fail and organs fail. In terms of our heart, there may be heart failure. There may be arrhythmia where the electrics don't work properly. There may be cardiac arrest with sufficient time. Of course, there may be brain injury. Our brain's a very sensitive organ and there may even be brain death as a result. And as a general rule, significant impairment of our airway and our breathing occurs from around a GCS of eight, Glasgow Coma Scale of eight. And in such scenarios, we may need to step in and provide ventilatory assistance. We may therefore need to introduce an artificial airway such as the endotracheal tube we will need to be able to suction that through to clear it from any secretions and of course we will need to be pushing air in via a ventilator so there are different uh, scenarios where we can have a patient with reduced level of consciousness in the intensive care unit and why they may need to be assessed it may be to do with how they've presented. They may have come in having seizures um, and therefore we need to be able to assess what's going on with their brain whilst they are obtunded. Um, they may have had a stroke. They may have had head trauma, all sorts of different reasons. Um, it may be that we have induced a reduced level of consciousness uh, using medications. A very common example or scenario is um, where people have got respiratory distress. We've just come through COVID now. Um, lots of people have ended up on ventilators. And in order for patients to be able to synchronize with the ventilator to accept it, they will need to be sedated uh, very often in order to allow that to happen. And there may be scenarios where patients may fail to awaken in the way that we expect, in the time that we expect, following sedation. So, um, there may be a variety of scenarios where we need to start thinking about how we can assess uh, why patients have a reduced level of consciousness. And of course, this is very difficult to do in intensive care patients. Um, there may be multiple reasons which may be, exist in isolation or combination. Uh, we may have sedated the patient. Uh, the patients may be confused, they may be combative, um, they may be in a periectal state, so they may have had uh, seizures and then the brain is dysfunctional in the period thereafter. It may be that the brain's working fine, but there is some significant neuromuscular weakness or paralysis, which is stopping patients from responding. And our clinical tools really do rely on motor assessments, motor responses, how uh, patients look around, how they can talk, how they move are all positive actions of some form of muscle movement. So 
Um, there are lots of reasons why intensive care patients may be challenging to uh, properly neurologically assess. Now, imaging is very helpful. Uh, you can see a very broad spectrum of pathologies and it can provide lots of very specific answers. But actually, it's often very difficult to transfer patients to a scanner. You can't do this all of the time. It takes a lot of planning and preparation and it doesn't reveal absolutely everything. We can help look for certain types of causes, for example, uh, hypoxic dysfunction and the degrees of damage uh, that can occur to the brain. We can look for signs of brain dysfunction, encephalopathy, and we can even sometimes see encephalitis which are invisible to the MRI scan. Um, seizures are something which are part of our bread and butter, uh, whether these are overt events, whether these are subtle events or just electrical events. Um, quite a few patients who end up in intensive care with seizures may not necessarily be related to epilepsy, so we can also have a role in that as well. Um, and EGs can be very useful for looking uh, to responses of um, treatments, monitoring of various treatments, and prognosis and brain death. I'm going to be doing a very separate video about that um, in the next one, and even normality and therefore alternative causes. These are some of the machines that you may see in an, uh, an intensive care unit. Uh, you know, with us, uh, usually it will be an EEG machine uh, to uh, look at the brain waves, but sometimes we may need to do something called evoked potentials, where we look at uh, the response to certain types of stimuli, for example, um, in the hands or the feet, and we can track the passage of those signals from the hands and the feet all the way up to uh, the brain. And sometimes we may need to do EMGs, uh, nerve conductions, to look for neuromuscular weakness. I've talked about the technology and the principles of all these different things in separate videos, and I'm sure you'll be able to click on a, a card above for some more um, information about these. So the most useful tests in the patient who has got an in depressed level of consciousness for whatever reason uh, from the neurophysiology department is going to be in EEG. The changes in an EEG are highly dynamic. They occur almost immediately, and they are reflective of uh, changing physiology almost um, within the millisecond. This is actually quite in contrast to uh, nerve conductions, which can actually take a, a couple of weeks for certain changes to manifest themselves. So these are highly dynamic uh, ways of assessing brain function. They are very sensitive for dysfunction and for degrees of cortical irritability, but they are rarely specific. And to say it's a very particular condition that is the cause of X, Y, or Z. It's very important to try and discuss uh, your request before you make it because it can affect um, how we do things. You know, what length of recording uh, we will need to do will vary by the situation and the indication, the type of wires we need to bring, perhaps the length of the wires, maybe even the choice of adhesive if they may be necessary, the choice of machine, the time allotted. Um, we need to think about the persistence of any uh, sedative uh, agents. So, if there's any hypothermia uh, that's gone on that can affect cortical activity. And we can also need to think about, in some certain situations, the roles of evoked potentials and nerve conductions, EMG. So it's usually worth having a phone call, discussing what you want before you uh, hit the uh, request button. I'm not going to go into uh, the details of what normal looks like. I've done that on a separate video, but this is what a normal EEG looks like. Um, just for uh, just a brief overview though, um, the right side here is the uh, are in red, the, the blue side of the brain are in blue. You can see all these little squiggles over here. This forms the alpha rhythm, separate video about that, uh, but that's what normal looks like. Contrast that with someone who's had cardiac arrest, has an isoelectric EEG, their cortical activity has been wiped out. They will have a very poor prognosis and we're going to talk about this separately. So that's a really bad EEG and that's normal just to contrast the two. This is someone who has got a severe alcohol-related hepatic encephalopathy. The liver's been very dysfunctional here and this ends up with the brain being dysfunctional um, for a a variety of very complex reasons. So this patient is going to have a depressed level of consciousness as a result because their brain is dysfunctional. This is status epilepticus. Um, so 
over here you can see this build up of a rapid um, fast activity uh, which uh, spreads across the brain establishes itself and then eventually it starts to settle down um, over here and then eventually we have what we call the post ictal phase where the EEG flattens and the brain uh, is quite dysfunctional for that period in the thereafter. This is someone who's had a stroke um, and has had seizures as a result of that and you can see here uh, these um, complex uh, pled discharges won't get into the exact meaning of that right now but these these are complex discharges over here and are reflective of an irritable brain in this region uh, following the stroke um, this is someone who has an NMDA encephalitis um, and uh, what you can see here is slowing of brain activity and also uh, lots of um, low voltage beta fast activity um, as well. Not all NMDA encephalitis um, have the extreme delta brush um, and this is why I've chosen this particular example of it. Um, this is someone with an HIV encephalitis where you can see an extreme delta brush pattern so it's not so it's not 100% specific to uh, NMDA and you can see it in a, a couple of other uh, scenarios too. This is someone who has an anti-mog encephalitis uh, and over here what we're seeing is just regional slowing. Uh, this patient uh, improved um, over several weeks um, and what I think is quite important to try and understand with all of this is that the science behind what we do is very precise and technically very demanding. We are amplifying microvolts, millionths of a volt, um, and the intensive care units, theatres are electrically adversive environments. There's lots of electrical um, uh, machinery, um, wiring, cabling uh, all over the place because people are reliant on all those different machines to keep them going uh, and they all produce uh, electrostatic um, noise in the air that we actually can pick up uh, and can interrupt our recordings and disturb them so it's very technically demanding you need to have specially trained staff and you need to have specialized kit which limits uh, what we can do is availability uh, there aren't that many neurophysiologists and neurophysiology technicians um, out there. In addition to which, apart from the environment, we're often dealing with very unwell, very complex patients, uh, which make things uh, challenging. And that can be particularly challenging, for example, those who may have uh, neurosurgical uh, patients with, with bone flaps. You can't necessarily put uh, leads exactly where you want them to. Um, and so there are lots of potential challenges and difficulties um, in trying to do these tests in certain types of patients. And ultimately, everything exists within a clinical context. Although, as I've said, we are rarely specific, um, the uh, precise clinical uh, context will very much determine uh, our interpretations. So thank you. I hope uh, that has been a helpful uh, overview of some of the things that we can do and assist with in the intensive care environment. I'm very happy to take questions uh, relevant to this particular topic uh, down below. Uh, if it's anything individual, very specific, uh, please don't. Um, and uh, please do support the channel by hitting that like, share and subscribe button. Uh, it's very helpful for the uh, progress of the channel. And um, thank you very much. Hope to see you in the next video shortly. Stay safe and well. All the very best.